Hello, I'm Andy Coulson and welcome back to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast that aims to guide you towards a more resilient approach to life from whatever it might throw at you. My guest today is the brilliant Professor Robert Winston, scientist, author, broadcaster and politician, a man who continues to devote himself to ending the crisis of infertility for so many parents with his pioneering treatments focused on IVF and the efficacy of embryo screening. But Lord Winston is also that rare breed of scientist, a professor who can speak fluent human and who through his award-winning TV programmes, including Child of Our Time and The Human Body, has helped millions reach a greater understanding of who we are and why we are who we are. As a member of the House of Lords since 1995 and a one-time Peer of the Year winner, Lord Winston has had an active political life. Earlier this year in the Lords, he revealed a personal crisis with the sad loss of his beloved wife, Lyra, who died suddenly at their home. Lord Winston described how with uh, Lyra in his arms, he called 999 only to be met with an operator who wasted precious time in getting an ambulance to the house. Lord Winston called for improved training for those emergency operators. With fertility and genomics never far from the headlines, Lord Winston has also faced down controversy throughout his career, media storms that would have made most scientists disappear back into the safety of the lab, but not so our guest, who I'm pleased to say is a man unafraid to give his clear opinion at a time when it's becoming increasingly and rather worryingly unfashionable to do so. Lord Winston, welcome to Crisis What Crisis. Nice to speak to you. I, 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 I have to say, I don't find it terribly easy to talk about myself, but I'll do my best. Uh, the, the, the question really that I'd like to start with, if I may, is that your, your working life, as I touched on in that introduction, your working life has been spent in large part, uh, you know, in, in the environment of the, of the most acute kind of personal crisis with parents who are unable to have a child. And although you've been able to help so many uh, with your work, you know, of course, the very nature of IVF means that for for most of the people you treat, um, it doesn't succeed. Um, how have you approached those highs, but also the lows, where I suspect you and um, uh, and I imagine the people that you work very closely with are, are faced with, you know, faced with elation and distress, and I suspect not very much in between. I think it's a very good question. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, when I started, um, I suppose when I was first offered the chance to run the infertility clinic, which was the first one actually uh, in Europe um, at that time, infertility wasn't really regarded as being that important. And the, John McClure Brown retired. He was my professor. Uh, and I, I was appointed as um running this infertility clinic at the Hammersmith, uh, the Royal Postgraduate Medical School. And um, uh, I told the senior uh, consultant in the, in, the, in the unit what I was doing, and he said to me, what on earth do you want to do the futility clinic for? That's how he described it. That's how he described it. And I think that was an extraordinarily common, probably male, um, re uh, response. Uh, in the 70s when I started that clinic. Mm -hmm. And it made me more aware that actually there was a real job to be done. But the reason why I did it, I think, were for lots of different reasons. First of all, I thought there was a huge amount we could do to improve infertility in, in the late 60s. And that had been quite important. And I was aware that a lot of people were pretty distressed by it. But I think what you're pointing out is quite important that is outside that very few people who admitted that they were infertile because they were ashamed about being infertile. Mm. Um, nobody realized that this was a crisis for people. I think that's the thing. And I think actually most men and women never talked about their, uh, their relationship, never talked about where they thought that they had failed, where they thought that they were so depressed that really they disappointed their partner, something which affected their sexual relationship most often, which actually affected their psychological health. Uh, people who found that they often didn't want to even go into work, and women who certainly would not want to go into a room where there were pregnant women, mm. people who wouldn't go to dinner parties, because, of course, at that certain age, when you're in your sort of 30s, that's what you talk about, your kids. So, I, I, I mean, all of that was something which became very revealing. And I think, actually, when IVF became a sudden 
sort of cause Salerno, uh, you know, it was perhaps the best thing that IVF did was not actually getting more children, but actually getting more people to talk about why they couldn't have children. Yes, yes. And, and I think that's not been really recognised sometimes, um, because, of course, what we've done and what I've done is to peddle in failure, because, uh, as you rightly point out, uh, most cycles of treatment fail, and nobody admits, no private clinic admits, nobody, even the HFA doesn't admit this, but actually if you start an in, in vitro fertilization treatment overall in Britain or in France or in Australia or in America, your chances of having a live baby at the end of one single cycle, at the beginning from the beginning of the cycle, is about 21%. So one in five, something like that. Yes. And, and, and the, the market doesn't mention that. And now, of course, we're still they're selling egg freezing. And if you look at that, about 0.2% of eggs that are frozen will actually result in a live baby. So, uh, Robert, that's so fascinating. Yeah. Having having brought this 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 you know uh, such an important fundamental really issue out from the dark and into the light, what does it what does it sort of shown you? What has it demonstrated to you about human resilience? Because when you're having that conversation uh, about the odds of success. Uh, when you're very happily, I suspect, the much easier conversation when when there is that moment of success, but the so much harder conversation uh, when when the process fails. What has that sort of shown you? What has that taught you about sort of human, I, I, human resilience, if you like? Well, I think actually what... I mean, I think towards the end of my clinical career, I'm still working, by the way, I still of do course, research of on embryos, but, 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 but at the end of my clinical career, I retired from medicine... Uh, you know, active medicine at 65, because unless you're doing it full time, you're probably not going to do it properly. So, um, and I had a lot of other things I really wanted to sort of dabble in. But I, but I think, um, I think what you do, what I found I was doing in my 60s, particularly in a clinic, was listening far more than talking. I finally understood, actually, that it took a long time, took a long time for me to understand that. And I think really, by listening, what I was able perhaps to do, insofar as I could do anything, was to actually help people find that resilience they were talking about. Because actually, you're going to fail a lot of the time. You're going to see people who are really actually gambling on a sort of one, two, five percent chance of that, this treatment working. And really, you've got to prepare them for the fact that there's a whole life outside there which has nothing to do with children. And that's difficult to do when you've been fertile. Um, I mean, I've, I've got three kids, uh, and I remember my six-year-old, we were sitting around the breakfast table one morning, uh, when he said two things one week, he said, uh, because at that time IVF was very much in the press, he said, tell me, he said, are more people born by the test tube or by the other method? And then about two weeks later, he said, looking around the breakfast table again, he said, Aren't we lucky? You've done it three times, and we've got three of us. <laughs> you know, so uh, come somehow. I was, live, you know, we were living in that sort of curious, bizarre world. It's almost, you know, it's, it's a very odd thing. And I think that um, trying to help people recognise that the, that you don't have to be ch have children uh, ultimately to be happy, even though it's probably the most fulfilling thing that we all do, because ultimately. As you know, um, it's the one life-changing event that, that that we can generally go through, apart from the loss of our parents, actually. Robert, you touched on the controversies there. There have been many over the years because, of course, the subject of fertility and of embryo screening provokes such strong emotions. Um, there have been times, I think, in your career when that's got pretty extreme. I mean, you've, you've, you've had death threats by people who disagree with your approach, disagree yes. with the work that you do? I mean, it was the way to confront that sometimes would come out in, on front. For example, I was repeatedly told on the media I was playing God. Uh, and that was really a common phrase that people used. It was headlines quite often, you know. Mm. And so I said, well, actually, of course I played God, because actually what we have to do, we're given a God-given intelligence, and we have to use that intelligence to improve a lot of people around us and our own lot, lot. So actually playing God is a good thing, not a bad thing. So it's band banding with words. Of course it is. Of course, I was, as a result, of course, um, that resulted in headlines that the man who thinks he's God, you know, or 
here he is praying God or whatever, mm. because of course. But on the other hand, it did bring out the silliness of that into the open. I think one of the things that really did help me, though, in the really early days was that particularly when some of the churches were so opposed to what we were doing and were doing everything to bring campaigns into Parliament and the Enoch Powell with his private members bill and various other things were going on, I think one of the things that was really helpful was to demonstrate that actually um, I equally came from a, a faith position mm -hmm. where actually um, fertility was regarded as being quite important, but actually um, it was it was designed, I mean, if you look, I mean, for example, you take the biblical supports, sources, I mean, one of the interesting things that people never thought about, in the, in, in, gen, in the book Genesis, interestingly called Genesis, of course, which can be all sorts of issues about that, but in Genesis, um, it, it, we see four matriarchs, uh, Sarah, who's Abraham's wife, then we see uh, Rebecca, who's um, Isaac's, uh, Isaac's wife, and then we see Leah and Rachel, who are the next generation, Jacob's wives. And of course, all four of those women are infertile. It's really interesting to consider that. Mm. Seriously infertile. Sarah, Sarah actually laughs about being told that she can have a child because she says it's impossible when she meets the angels. Um, Rebecca has great problems in her pregnancy when she finally gets pregnant with, with, pregnant with her two twins struggling inside a womb, as it says in the Bible. And what Rachel says as the pretty wife of of Jacob, she says something really interesting to him. Uh, what she says in Hebrew is, uh, give me children or else I'm as good as dead. And the husband, Jacob, replies, am I in God's stead that I can help you? I.e. dismissing her. Mm. He's got lots of wives. And uh, I mean, I, the reason why I mention this is because actually it's a fundamental position, which is in um, biblical terms, you know, used by the Abrahamic faiths who are being so critical of what I was trying to do with infertility. And of course, showing exactly that this is a time-related, long-standing problem which has gone right through human history, mm. that actually infertility has been a very serious issue in many different areas, in many different faiths, in many different religions. And of course, I was well aware, for example, that if you're an infertile woman in Africa, in parts of Africa, once you're infertile, of course, you're abandoned. You have to leave the house. You are no longer, in fact, even a person. And you couldn't get pregnant again. You might not even have any support. So you 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 were completely isolated. And that, of course, has happened in uh, many parts of the world. It's not just, of course, in Africa. It certainly was true in the Middle East as well. Um, yeah. And I worked firsthand with some of the people I treated, particularly from the, you know, from the from the Gulf states. Of course, more recently, you've you've found yourself getting criticism for having, you know, the audacity to give your opinion as a scientist, uh, as a fertility expert on the gender debate. Uh, for some, for some, that's put you on the wrong side of what of what it is to be progressive, at least for them. But I listened to a BBC interview you gave in 1996, Robert, and you were asked on a very respectable program by a very respectable broadcaster in pretty sniffy tones, it has to be said, to justify why you thought it was right to offer fertility treatment to widows and, heaven forbid, lesbians. Um, things change, don't they, uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, I, think I think I'm rather proud of that, actually. And so, I, you, and so you should be. Um, yeah, Britain, but, I think in Britain I was certainly the first person to offer lesbian treatment. And interestingly, uh, it came about with a, the, the, a, a very famous editor of a very well-known tabloid newspaper, which we will remain, which will remain new uh, uh, um, um, nameless, uh, actually phoned me and said, um, we want you to write an article, you know, uh, maybe we'll give you a thousand words, whatever, uh, about le why lesbians uh, justify treatment uh, with IVF. And I said, well, I'm not going to write that for you because, you know, you'll plaster my, my, my article with all sorts of objections and negatives and he said no we won't edit it and we'll promise you'll give you the complete page and i thought well you know what have i got to lose then and that was um, that was very much running against the grain i mean you mentioned completely you, yes you, you mentioned you mentioned sort of you know the media at the time but it was something that ran right the way through the kind of national narrative that interview that i mentioned was not an interview with a tabloid newspaper that was an interview on one of the most respectable programs on bbc radio it was you were you were absolutely pushing against the tide in a 
in a in in a, you know in a, in, a, in an in an entirely kind of uh, a ch- challenging uh, 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 context. Uh, you're right to be proud uh, of, of of that. I think is is what I'm saying. Um, I, Robert, I think and and I, I think you have to say, I have to say something to you at this point. You know, this is not this is not me. Don't forget that you know. You know, no, you know, there's, we have this sort of celebrity culture, which is such a bad thing. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we've had the wrong prime minister sometimes. <laughs> uh, you know, the celebrity culture basically takes over. Yes. Uh, and it, it, it produces all sorts of ridiculous. The fact, of course, is I was extremely, I, I'd assembled a team around me, mm. hugely supportive and actually more important than me, because had I had that conversation with them, I knew perfectly well they would say the same thing. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the, there was a, there was a. I, I, I was lucky when I appointed people to the unit to find. I mean, I didn't. I didn't actually go for the best scientists because I'm not a great scientist myself. I went for the people I thought I would get on with, and who I felt you know were somewhat like-minded. We would go out for a meal or something. And I think actually, you know, one of the big ways of dealing talking about resilience. One of the biggest way of dealing with problems actually is to build things around you with people who you respect. Do you think valuable and actually can work in collaboration? And I think that collaboration is really important in terms of resilience. So, you know, it's another thing that I would just drop in here. I think that's absolutely right. It's interesting. That's come up in a number of conversations that we had, that kind of Im- the importance of a sort of esprit de corps. Yes. Um, yeah, so actually, uh, of course, you can still be misled and be wrong. Um, I had that problem, of course, when I first treated somebody with HIV which was hugely controversial. And we filmed the conversation and it was filmed on t- television on a popular program called um, uh, Making a Baby, Making Babies, Making yes. Babies. And my whole team was opposed to me. And I was horrified because I'd, I'd had three interviews with this woman in the clinic before deciding that really we ought to offer her IVF for various reasons. Mm. When I told my team and told them on camera because they were doing a fly on the wall documentary, I got really negative responses and it took about six months before I felt more and more confident that what I'd said to this woman I had to carry out. And eventually, of course, the whole team came round, but it took a while. And I think um, that wasn't brave. It was just basic real disappointment. And I think on camera, I I remember giving an interview on the stairway somewhere, um, uh, which clearly showed my disappointment because the cameraman had just chosen a remarkable backdrop which was this sort of curving staircase which was going downwards and somehow it kind of was a a visual metaphor i think for the fact that really we had to be much more open-minded i'm really keen to talk to you more about the um the sort of transparency piece which you you know you've been a pioneer on the scientific front i think you've been a pioneer on the on the transparency piece as we've already touched on but i want to get into that in a little bit more detail later before we do uh, robert crisis came pretty early in life for you you lost your father lawrence when you were just nine years old he was, i was eight i wasn't you, quite nine you were eight <laughs> you were eight years old he was uh, he was i think 42 an amazing man as i say from from what i've read a true polymath a diamond craftsman, but also a talented, uh, very talented chess player and violinist. It must have been a terribly, uh, obviously terribly dis- distressing time for you and your family when you lost him. When you, when you look back now, do you think your early experience of grief armed you in some way for the profession you know you were to follow? My, my father had been ill for a, you know, a trivial illness for about six months. And, and actually, um, I think the grief wasn't mine, it was my mother's. And I think actually I hugely, I could see that my father and mother had a very vibrant relationship. I mean, it was, wasn't an entirely normal relationship, easy, you know, easy relationship, because they used to argue, you know, they were, you know, they were quite volatile, but they were brilliant because actually, you know, they were very firm, very happily married. I'm very sure they had a very strong sexual relationship too. And, and basically, I think I saw the grief of my mother as an eight and nine year old as being um, how she dealt with it. And she was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, she 
she she she wasn't working. Uh, we didn't have any money because my father didn't expect to die, and you know he was earning enough money. Of course he was, but you know he didn't leave anything that was really valuable. In fact, she sold his possessions, including his boat, for next to nothing. Mm. So really, really, she was really really short of cash, and the family weren't able to support her. She had to go out to work. She worked very long hours. She was coming home at sometimes eleven and twelve at night later on, and I was by the age of eleven and twelve very much in loco parentis at home with two younger siblings and i was very conscious i had to protect her and try and see how i could be supportive and i went to and i was then of course at a school which was a high achieving school some some pools and i got in i was entered there but you know i i, I was very conscious that you know um i my I, they were paying fees for me and i knew that my sister had also got a place at the girls school and uh, and basically uh, fortunately, we both got scholarships. So actually, in fact, that was a massive relief. Mm. But I was very conscious of the of the financial situation, and I think actually, I, I think truthfully, the loss of my father was more important to me than I only now realise. It was basically, I really underperformed as a as in the senior school. I mean, I didn't really do anything very important at all. I learned to do things that I enjoyed doing, like theatre and, and chess and stuff. But you know, didn't get particularly good O levels, and certainly uh, when it came to A levels, I don't think they thought I would get anything like the sort of A levels I got. And I was told I wouldn't probably get to university, and and um, so I, I was aware that I was not fulfilling expectations. And suddenly there was a crisis in the exams the year before A level, when I suddenly realised I really had to change. I had to really pull my finger up. And I realized I was not only letting my mother down, but actually myself down. And mm. so I worked really for the first time and focused. And, you know, that, that sort of did at least give me decent A-levels. Um, it, de- decent, it was- decent A-levels. And you went to, and you went to, uh, on to, on to university. Um, uh, and, uh, Without knowing what I wanted to do. I mean, I really yeah. wanted to read English because I loved English, but actually I ended up doing, you know, I had a place to do um natural sciences at Cambridge, but it wasn't for a year. And on the off chance, I thought, I don't want a gap year because I really would need to earn some money. And then I thought, well, actually, um, I could get a grant if I if I went, because uh, that time people were still being called up. So I was uh, able to be called up, or, or would still be, the call up was necessary. Yeah. So doing medicine suddenly looked quite interesting and actually very glamorous. Mm. I didn't, because I wanted to be a doctor, really. I didn't know what that really meant. But it just looked interesting. I was very lucky. I, you know, various things happened, and I ended up as a in a very junior post at, at Hammersmith, but was fairly rapidly promoted and got a research project going and so on. So that was helpful. And 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 you chose fertility despite those conversations about futility, because well, you think, because you yes. saw you did you feel a you, you've already uh, explained why. You know, this, this, it wasn't just about the science. It was also this idea of bringing, you know, bringing something that was in the shadows into the into the light. Um, that was a bit later on because the first yeah. research I did was not related to fertility at all. It was related to various microorganisms which cause problems mainly for women, and also uh, of, um, some problems in pregnancy with uh, with blood clotting. So it was a little while before I got round to. Uh, uh, fertility, but then I realised that there was, there was a wide open field, and actually, quite truthfully, this is not in any way, uh, uh, you know, making myself grander or less grand. But I suddenly thought, actually, there's no research going on in this. There's a vast amount of research we're doing, and you know, if you're not brilliant, you know, why not go into an area where there is not much competition? Mm. And it was a good decision, actually, and I think it's advice that I would give to young people still today. Um, you know, IVF was, you know, not thought about as being serious as a possibility. Um, I, I, I had fertilized embryos in the past as a schoolboy because I'd done that with sea urchins when I was 16. So I'd seen embryos developing under the microscope, which turned me on to biology, but I never thought you could do it in humans because everybody said it was impossible. Yes. But I mean, it's oddly odd that 20 years later, of course, or so, you know, IVF became up on, on the books and suddenly there was that that revolution but before that of course i was doing a lot of work on the fallopian tube which was a key part of fertility because that's where we all actually are conceived actually in the fallopian tube not not ivf and 
So I did a lot of work on physiology and that was published in quite good journals. And that really sort of gave me a bit of, um, a, that gave me a, a kind of a, a minor reputation. And mm. then of course, trying to change the surgery made a big difference as well. You weren't certain about IVF as a process, were you? When no, it, I wasn't when, when, when it started, no. no. Uh, even after we had the first babies uh, uh, in the unit, you know, when, you know, when we started in the first three or four years, there were very few babies were born after Louise Brown, you know, only, only a handful. Um, everybody was trying to do it and it was unsuccessful. And um, I was hugely lucky because I met up with a man called Stephen Hillier, who was absolutely just amazing. He, he, he read an advertisement I put in Nature that I wanted somebody to help me as a scientist. And the reason why he came along, and the first thing he said at the interview was, of course, I know nothing about, I could know nothing about IVF, he said. But of course, what he had done was to do extensive work on hormones, and that was the secret. The big secret, really, that really got it going was how you controlled the hormones to make, you know, a viable egg possible and regular fertilization. And that, plus the help of Anne McLaren, who was a fantastic scientist, one of the great female scientists of her generation, who had done this in mice, that was really significant. And so that really, it was encouraging. And, you know, everything, you know, everything depended on other people. And and, and, um, and Steve Hillier, actually, who just basically realized we had to change the entire environment in which we were working and so on, and, and that made a big difference. It's quite a thing, though. I mean, you were, you know, you were having success getting recognition for your approach, which was focused on on, on the fallopian tube, as, as, as you mentioned. You're seeing things happening, you know, from the IVF, IVF perspective. You're you're doubting that, but then presumably there's a moment we say, actually, I'm wrong about this, and yes, I'm and I'm well. going to and I'm going to have, and, and I'm not afraid to say so, and I'm going to change direction here. Uh, and that's that's quite a particularly in the particularly in the scientific field to do that was quite a big decision for you, presumably. It's interesting because actually looking back, I you know by that time I'd done one of the world's first fallopian tube transplant, mm. which was, you know, which I didn't ever talk about, you know, uh, um, but of course, in real terms, it was surgically, it was quite a demanding thing to do. And and um, the tube was open after the surgery, too. And uh, the woman didn't get pregnant for various reasons, but she might have done. Um, so I was still, I'm still trying to, to uh, uh, ride on two horses, really. But to make that decision, is that another piece of advice, really, that we should be giving here? That even I, I, when you, even when you are progressing and and to an extent being lauded for the approach that you're taking, to keep an open mind that it might not be the one where you should focus your time, effort, and career in the future. Yes, I think I irritated the hell out of people who are who are trying to do IVF. Though I, I think that made a lot of enemies because because <laughs> I was saying that IVF is never going to work sufficiently to work in the NHS because it's never going to be su successful enough. You know, it's going to be too specialised. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have the vision that actually this is what the NHS actually could do quite well, which was actually to find time and space to do specialised medicine. I now think that clinical academics uh, actually really advance specialised medicine by doing exactly this. And, of course, perhaps in that sense I was lucky because... I was at the postgraduate medical school where the chance of being a successful clinical academic was really, really helpful because people there didn't really care very much about, you know, how much you were doing clinically. You know, if you had an interesting idea that you wanted to follow, they were very supportive. And I was given the space, uh, you know, I was given a certain amount of uh, ability to raise funds and so on. And, and, um, I was just very lucky with that department. And Professor McClure Brown, again, you know, he was one of the great people. So I think one, you know, and he was very, you know, he was very, uh, very retiring, very modest man. I remember once I wrote a paper, which, where I'd done most of the work, but he'd been very much, you know, the, the brains behind what I had been doing. And I, I brought the paper into his office to say, because it was, it was at the top, it said Winston and McClure Brown. That's what I labeled it uh, with, the, with the piece of paper. And he said, well, he said, that's a great, it's, this is a great piece of work. He said, there's one thing wrong with it, though. It's seriously wrong. You've got my name on it. Take it off. And I said, but, you know, you've been really important in this. You, I couldn't have done this without you. He said, no, no, it's not my work. And I, I actually argued with him. And finally, he said something really amazing. He said, he said, well, I'll allow you to um, 
um, submit it to a, a journal. We were going to submit it. Nature, he said, which is in one of the top journals. Mm -hmm. I didn't know actually. But he said, but let me, um, if you do that, I have to write a letter to the editor saying I had nothing to do with the work. Goodness. And he bloody well did that, too. Yeah, yeah. and a, an important moment for you. And it was published immediately. Yeah. I mean, it was extraordinary. You know, I mean, it, it, you know, it went through peer review in a matter of three weeks and, you know, was, was, um, was a, for me, a very big paper, actually. Nothing to do with IVF, but important. Yes. Robert, your work, as we've, as we've already touched on, came under serious political attack in the, um, in the early 80s. At one stage, um, you were described as evil by the Catholic Church. Uh, your work on embryo research, I think, was the focus. Um, as, as I touched on in the intro, that might have caused you to say, well, you know, I'm going to go back into the lab and do my work uh, and I shall, you know, I shall just concentrate on what I do and and we'll make the argument from a sort of scientific perspective only. But you didn't do that. As you've already mentioned, you invited the TV cameras into your uh, into your lab at Hammersmith Hospital. You opened up. You know, that was a very, very high-risk approach. Just can give me a sense of what your thinking was at, at that moment, because as you've already mentioned, your, even your team were reticent, concerned about, about you taking that approach. What was, what was the sort of driving thought in your mind there? Oh, gosh, I think irritation, anger. Um, there was Enoch Powell who was presenting this private members' bill to parliament, which I thought was would destroy IVF working anywhere in Britain uh, and leave us way behind, if not worldwide eventually, because it was so, um, it was so, um, you know, it was doing everything to prevent embryo research, which of course was how IVF was developed. Robert, right. Robert you um, you joined the House of Lords as a, as a Labour peer in 1995. You, you said that you hated the first six months there. Um, sounds from what I've read that, that those first six months felt like a, another one of those kind of mini work crises, essentially, that you had a form of uh, sort of imposter syndrome. Is that, is that, is that right? It's very interesting because, I mean, I, I was asked when I, I mean, I didn't know that my name was in Downing Street at the time, and I was asked by the leader of the Labour Party, we've been reading your stuff, you seem to be quite favourable to the Labour Party, would you, uh, would you, he asked me if I would support the Labour Party or in its debates or perhaps even, you know, speak with them. And I said, yeah, quite probably. And he absolutely said, why? And I said, well, I'm a member of the Labour Party. And he said, are you sure? That was that was the conversation. So I didn't go in as a crossbencher. Hmm. Um, I, I, I said, no, of course, you know. And of course, actually, um, I, 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 I found out that Tony Blair was very supportive of my nomination, but I didn't really ever speak to him before that. So I had no idea that that was, you know, Thing. And actually, my wife was very opposed to my going into the House of Lords at all and, and said, look, you know, I'll never see you again. Uh, and I and she said, she said, look, I don't want to be a lady. So, <laughs> and so, I mean, she was she was a very modest individual was Lyra. She was not, you know, she 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 wanted she wanted family life. And, um, you know, we were married for 50 years, almost just a year short. And I mean, um, she was pretty amazing because she put up with me actually choosing that decision and, and never complained about it. Um, Robert, your, your, your wife, Lyra, very sadly died a, a year ago in a very moving speech um, earlier this year in the Lords. You explained how as, as she was you know, dying in your arms, you were, you were shocked by the response of the 999 operator. Can you, um, can you, can you tell us um, what, what happened? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it's something that I don't want to sort of go over too much because, frankly, um, you know, I've, obviously it would have made any difference, I don't know, but the, the operator at the other end started to quiz me about my wife and I was trying to say, look, she's critically ill. Uh, but, of course, I had her in my arms and I knew very well that the last thing you lose as you're dying or going under anaesthesia is, uh, is words and the voice and you understand what's being said to you. So I was very conscious. I couldn't want to say to her, look, she's dying. I didn't want to say that this is a catastrophic emergency thing like that. But I knew that she was about to have a cardiac arrest because her breathing changed. And I tried to say, look, her breathing has changed. She's changed Stokes breathing, I said. I didn't say I was a doctor. Mm. The guy the other end said, well, count the number of breaths she's having. I said, there isn't time for me to do that. I need the ambulance emergency. He said, look, tell me, what's the interval of seconds between each breath? 
I said, look, this is not important. She's breathing irregularly. Um, this is needed now. And this conversation went on, and it seemed to go on for hours. It probably didn't at all. It was probably seconds. They've probably got a recording of it somewhere. I don't know, because I think they do record these conversations. Anyway, when the ambulance arrived, of course, it was too late, but it probably would have been anyway. You know, there's a lot of COVID going around, and it took, I think, about 18 minutes, which was just a bit too long, really. And when the paramedics came, they were over... Um, uh, over anxious, and they actually kept going for far too long. They were really not prepared to give up. They, mm. they didn't want to give up. I have eventually had to tell them, look, you know, you've done all you could possibly do. You know, you put up the drip, you've cardioverted her, it's not working, and I totally accept that, you know, she, she's dead. Um, I, and, you know, I, I think at that time, I mean, there's so many emotions you go through, you think it's your fault. Um, and, you, and I thought after that I could have called a private ambulance. Actually, bizarrely, about a few weeks earlier, you know, she'd, she'd actually stuck a notice up of a private ambulance um, phone number, which I thought she thought, well, if we ever have an emergency, that might be something that we should consider. I never, I didn't remember it even, mm. st still stuck up on the kitchen door behind me. Mm. But, I, but I, I mean, you know, I, I think stupid, you start to thinking stupid things. I remember I had an argument about something totally trivial, uh, two days beforehand, when um, basically it was something she'd said to me at the dinner party with other people present that I'd rather she hadn't said, and I thought she said it in the wrong way. And I sort of, when we got home, I argued with her, and she didn't respond. And uh, and actually, when she did respond, I didn't say anything. And then after she died, I realised, you know, I should, I never got round to apologising to her. Oh. Which is stupid, really, because of course you know um, it didn't matter. It wasn't important. Probably yes. universal, but you know it was it was that those sorts of things. So one, one's grief is not obviously very uh, obvious, and actually I don't think uh, I, I didn't. I think my grief wasn't very obvious at all at the time, and uh, you know to some extent probably still isn't. Uh, but it, it it you know it's a massive gap, um, and and. It is with anybody, and it sort of teaches you how people respond to loss in very different ways. And, um, you know, I, one thing is you start wondering if your own life is worth continuing. I mean, it's obviously you think about that. Um, but, I, I, you know, I mean, what you learn, I don't know. I think people learn different things, and people react to grief very differently, and um some people bottle it up and that may be a good or bad thing and sometimes they're very open and that may be a good or bad thing um i think maybe now it might help me a bit dealing with other people's grief probably not much actually because i think i've seen grief in the fertility clinic mm. um, in a way that i do understand and realize that actually we have to recognize that sometimes grief means termination of something and moving on and i think with in vitro fertilization, some of the most important things you can do, I really believe this very strongly, is actually to refuse to treat somebody when they really want treatment. Mm -hmm. It's high-handed, and it's very, very uh, opportunistic. But if you think they've got a fraction of 1%, or whatever it might be, and really this is just going to go continuing damaging, they've tried seven times, it's really time to try and say, look, why don't we shut the gate? Why don't we look at some other things? And why don't we... And I mean... I think some patients benefit from that that conversation and some don't, you know, I think. So it, it, because if they don't benefit, they'll ignore your advice and go somewhere else. Mm. But unfortunately, we've, we've unfortunately sold in vitro fertilization, which has really, really become now the only treatment for infertility, and it really isn't. And I think that has not been helpful. And I think sometimes people go into in vitro fertilization not getting properly investigated, and half of them fail, and half of those people get pregnant spontaneously anyway, eventually. Robert, first of all, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, as the, the, the first and most important thing that I'd like to say on, on my behalf and behalf of everyone who's listening to this, I'm sure. The second thing I'd like to say, that in answer to that question, you know, how does one sort of find purpose after such a loss? I mean, your work is so fundamentally important to so many people i mean that is presumably your family of course first and foremost but presumably the answer that that, that that comes pretty quickly to you i mean you are still working 
um, uh, hard on trying to solve, you know, yes, a, a so crisis of infertility to... still for so many people. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I've interrupted you, sorry, but I was going to say that, um, yeah, we've, you know, I, with wonderful Sheba Jarvis, who's my sort of closest colleague, we're, we're working on a, a project which might really improve in vitro fertilization. But I'll tell you what I have found, which is something I was doing while Lyra was very much alive, and I was doing it increasingly. I was doing a lot of schools outreach. I get huge pleasure from talking to school children of all ages, from six up to 18, about ambition, about um, uh, um, fulfillment, uh, about, uh, about you know, getting out of the environment that they may find themselves in and so on, and talking about success and failure, as well as talking about science. And I mean, I'm doing this a lot, so I'm doing this several times a week, and it's part of the thing that I do is going to schools all over England, um, you know, north of England, northeast, northwest, uh, and you know, and I go wherever schools uh, invite me. So if a school invites me, invites me, I can't go because actually I, I find I, they don't sometimes they, don't, they understand that you know, obviously I don't like long tra train journeys, but actually, and sometimes you think, what the hell are you doing? But when you get there, um, I, I just find that contact mm. with uh, young people. Um, rewarding to me and sometimes I think it actually really does make an impact for them so um that's something which I've I've, I've really um been quite uh, energized by and it turns out that actually of course uh, you know my my wife was heavily involved with education anyway professionally yes uh, and so actually you know in a, in a sort of way sort of in a different kind of way continuing uh, this notion about education being the opportunity. I do wish that government would stop talking about levelling up and recognising that the levelling up, of course, is needed simply by improving education. If we just improve primary school education, we would do so much to level up in a way that we don't, we don't do other ways. But tinkering at the outside, that's how you change people's futures and changing because they then change their own environment. And unfortunately, governments can't do that very much because it's so costly. Mm. And but actually, we could do much more by focusing it on on the education, particularly of the, the youngest. You know, from from you know from primary school, particularly early on in primary school. And at the moment, we don't value primary school teachers nearly enough because they have a, an immeasurably hard job, particularly in the prime parts of the country. Yes, where. The, those children are going home to add a single without a room with a you know a house without a single book. Yes, yes. But well, we don't respect teachers enough. Full stop. Can we go back to the science? Um, are, are we yeah. are, are we heading towards, or perhaps we're already in uh, a, a crisis with regard to you know genomics? Are, are are you concerned about the direction of travel and the speed of travel with genetic engineering in particular? Well, it's a very really, very it's a very topical question because at the moment we've got this bill going through Parliament, which is the Genetic Technology Precision Breeding Animals Bill, which is being promoted by DEFRA. But essentially, of course, it's a science bill because actually it depends on the science working. And the problem, of course, is that you know DEFRA sees it as a you know as a way of releasing organisms in the, in the environment. And unfortunately, very few of us are really fighting this because. The science is very far from certain. And the idea that you can have precision breeding is a nonsense. The word precision is complete nonsense. If you talk about precision medicine, you can't have precision biology, biologically because the very, nature of, um, the very nature of biology is that what you do is unpredictable. And sometimes it'll work, but sometimes it won't. So to my mind, the government are at risk of running into something at the moment of course, the bill is still going through the House of Lords, which actually is open to all sorts of imprecise things that we can't predict. But unfortunately, the government, of course, are, you know, they're not scientists. They don't have a, a scientist who's speaking. You know, the perfectly nice minister who's a good person in the House of Lords who has no scientific background. And he's, uh, I think, one of our intelligent ministers, you know, and he's a, a good person. He's listening. But of course, you know, the science that is being, that he's being fed doesn't seem to me to be accurate from the literature of the science that I read or from my own personal experience in the laboratory. So, you know, you know, we've been fighting quite till quite late in the evening um, uh, on the committee stage. It's had no publicity to speak of, but actually I think it's time perhaps that people realize that this does need 
very careful thought and very careful legislation so that actually there isn't a risk of either releasing plants that might be dangerous or animals that might be um, dangerous in different ways to the environment or to other animals and of course of course to human health and and of course you know i'm not convinced entirely the government have got that right and i think therefore one of the you know when people are talking about abolishing the house of lords suddenly i find that i'm a lone voice because i'm the only scientist really almost the only scientist anyway talking in these terms mm. uh, in a government bill and you suddenly think well there's a real point in having some experts in parliament who are not yes. really and 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 you know so i'm I'm, it's given me a kind of lease of life, really, it's sort of in a, the last couple of days. I mean, it's ridiculous to say that because you know I'm doing other stuff, but but you know it, it is. It's just an example of where you know, it, it, that I think we need to be a bit more cautious about things. Which uh, scientists are very very ready to be quite certain. They don't like uncertainty. Mm. Of course, we had to face it during COVID, um, but we've already forgotten that, and and. You know, it's important that we do remember um, that actually what we do often has completely unpredictable uh, consequences. And the classic example is the one that we're most facing with, facing at the moment, which is climate change. And the reason why we're facing climate change, of course, is because of our science and the technology which was developed from the science back in the 18th century, 19th century. And, you know, the Industrial Revolution is really the prime reason why we're now fighting like mad to try and work out how we deal with the issues which science and technology have raised and i think we have to be really cautious in that respect because you know we could certainly make animals that might be resistant to climate change we might be able to make plants particularly that are resistant to drought and uh, disease free but in doing so we might br 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 breed other diseases that we aren't predicting mm. so you might make a herd of cattle completely resistant to, let's say, a common disease like foot and mouth. But then suddenly that herd might be wiped out because you found another disease, which is another virus, which is more prevalent. And we should be learning from the coronavirus because that actually, of course, probably came through animals like the pang pangolin and the bat. We don't know. Yes. Um, and, and, and therefore, I think we have to recognize that whilst, you know, I'm not certain about what I'm saying, but I think there's a need to be cautious. Of course, I want to see... Um, animals being bred in the best possible way. Of course, I'd like to see plants which are really helping the, you know, the developing world to to uh, gain nutrition. But actually, for the moment, the farming we've got uh, is pretty reliable and can be profitable. Of course, actually, the government wants to make a lot more money with the industrialization of these uh, these new technologies, understandably. But one has to accept that every time we do that, there are risks with technology that we need to be very, very conscious of. And your, Sorry, your, view, and your, and your view in that context absolutely carries across, I suspect, even more so when we look at the human genome. Your view is you mess with that at your peril. I agree, absolutely. I think it's really something we shouldn't do because the real problem is we've been messing with the human embryo and there's a human embryo potentially there and that embryo can't give informed consent for what you're doing and to my mind that's critical because our ethics depend on one of those key principles the understanding of the technology the informed consent and the and the and the real concern that you might be damaging rather than improving life mm. does your sense of is crisis the right word to use on this topic do you feel a sense of crisis on where the science is heading on this well, you know, when when my colleagues, you know, some of them at the Crick Universe talk, uh, you know, universe, the Crick Institute talk about, um, you know, precision and precision medicine. I think you know they have to understand that in in in, in biology and certainly human biology, particularly, there's no such thing as precision. It, 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 of course, we can we can improve things with DNA technology and gene technology and so on, but we improve them. We it's not perfect, um, and you know there are very few genetic diseases. Uh, you know what 20 more than 20 years after the sequencing of the human genome which we greatly talked about which have actually really been improved massively by this technology and resulted actually in huge numbers of cures yes we've made great strides certainly we've improved some cancers and many other examples as well but there's a hell of a long way to go and you know i at the moment i've got really bad eyesight and in fact i'm going to have um 
because <laughs> I can't read. Um, I, I, my next um, stage in my treatment is to have some inje injection of some modified cells into my eye to try and repopulate my the, my cornea mm. on both sides. Well, of course, you know, I realize that that might be a gamble. I mean, it's, it's, it's not precision. Um, it, you know, I'm told it's likely to work, but it doesn't work every time and might make things worse. So I, so I think, you know, we, we have to be much more aware that we're likely to seem arrogant. And I think arrogance in any expertise is very dangerous. It's particularly dangerous in science because science depends on uncertainty. We do science because we're uncertain. That's why we do it. Yes. Robert, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we end every podcast by asking our guest uh, for their three crisis cures. And I hesitate to use the word cure in the presence of an eminent scientist. Um, uh, but these are three things. Can't be another person that you sort of lean on through or have lent on through the tough times. Um, what comes to mind when I ask uh, for your cures? I think find, find mentors who you trust. Um, Anne McLaren was a very good example, I think you know, a brilliant female scientist, um, and there should be more of them. Um, I, I think work in collaboration with a team of people you get on. Um, and I think a mixture of being persistent, but also recognizing failure is really valuable because failure teaches you to do it better next time. Reacting to the failure, accepting the failure and being prepared to change course. Mm. Mm. Super. Robert, Lord Winston, thank you again for joining us on, uh, on Crisis What Crisis. We really appreciate it. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. And if you hit subscribe wherever you download your podcast from, you'll find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, and you can watch the full episodes on YouTube. Just search for Crisis What Crisis podcast. You can also find full transcripts of this and every episode on our website, crisiswhatcrisis.com. Thanks again for joining us. <laughs>